Welcome to Vancouver Business Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I am Roger Killen, the organizer. This talk is brought to you by Ion Connect. This state-of-the-art co-working space and tech lab helps grow innovative ideas to commercialization and market launch. Our speaker is Francesca Anastasi. Francesca is a business growth strategist a savvy consultant and a mentor. Her business is FA Consulting, Training and Coaching. Francesca's top core value is integrity. Her top three likes are coffee, sunsets by the ocean, and a good pasta dish. Her top three dislikes are cigarette smoke, sarcasm, and raw onions. <laughs> Francesca's mission is to inspire everyone she meets to live their best, most fulfilling life. Vancouver Business Network members and most welcome guests, it's time now for you to put your hands together and give Francesca Anastasi, Stasi, Anastasi, <laughs> and Francesca Anastasi as well, a warm BBN welcome. <laughs> Well, good evening and thank you for coming and I was actually very excited when Roger asked me to speak about lessons I've learned from launching a social movement because I've never spoken about this before I've never really shared this and can I just get a show of hands I know there's one person for sure in, in, in the spring that has started a social movement is anyone else who has a social so movement? Can you please uh, define what you mean by social movement? Right? Social so movement, movement is when you get people interested to join into um, a cause or a concept. Just one person, two, two, three, four people, great. And how many of you are actually thinking about doing it? How many of you started it and how many of you thinking about doing it? Okay, so you're just here to learn some of the lessons I learned the hard way. All right. <laughs> so as you heard, um, I am an entrepreneur. That's who I am at the core, not by inspiration, but it was inspiration driven by desperation. I'll tell you a little bit of my story just so that you get a little background on why I do what I do today. And I also founded a social movement, which is what I'm going to be talking about today and the lessons I learned through that. And as you heard before, I am a business growth and leadership consultant, trainer, and mentor. So until 2001, I had no idea, no intention to ever have a business and to ever work for myself. That was not what I wanted to do. I had a job, but at the beginning of 2001, the company I was working for was not doing very well and unfortunately had to let everybody go, including one. So as any person would do, I started looking for work. I was a single mom at the time, and I was going to job interview after job interview after job interview, and I was not landing jobs. And I was looking for work. I was either not qualified, overqualified, not the right fit, you name it, it just wasn't happening. Fast forward, my employment insurance was running out. And now I'm like, okay, nobody's hiring me, what am I gonna do? And September 11 happened. And the interviews stopped completely. So I'm like, okay, there is no no unemployment insurance coming in. Nobody's hiring me. Interviews have stopped. What do I do? Welfare was not an option. So I decided to hire myself. So I did a little bit of searching and I thought, what can I possibly do? I've never been interested in, I have no university degree and I've never studied anything about business. Like I said, it was not what I wanted to do. But I love to dance since I was a little girl. And I got to train as a dancer as an adult. I did not do the dance school as a child. So I thought, I became a professional dancer uh, because I was helping my teacher Form and performing with them. And I was helping them teach for free just because I wanted the exchange and lessons. So I thought, well, you know, I'm helping other people do this on my spare time. 
why can I make this my bread and butter? So I decided I would open a dance studio for grown-ups like me who had never had the opportunity to do dance school when they were little so that they could learn and have an opportunity now. I enrolled myself in a self-employment program and no one believed my idea would work. So, but I did. I knew, I did my market research and I knew that people would be interested in coming and learning as adults if I provided a safe space for them. Long story short, I did the course, opened my doors, dance studio, nobody came. <laughs> Complete flop. First day. I'm sitting in the middle of the dance floor thinking, what did I do wrong? It's like I did everything by the book, everything I learned from business and the business program why is this not working? Why did I not get the client? So I went back to the drawing table and I figured out I have to get in the head of my customer. I had to really get in their head and to understand how that my customer thinks. I am my customer. So having done that, I redid my whole marketing campaign, relaunched my marketing, sold out every class and the business went skyrocketed. And, and it kept growing from there. So I had a really successful dance company. And in that dance company, I was also producing shows for students. So getting those events going. So I fell in love with the business side. In the process of learning how to make my business grow, I fell in love with that part of the business. What I did not expect was as any good teacher would do, because I didn't just own the studio, I was also one of the instructors, among all the other instructors. I was training all the time just to stay on top of things, just like anybody would do in any field. And I was away taking a, a workshop with one of the big gurus. And it was on the weekend, I was having breakfast with another instructor from another city. And over breakfast, over breakfast we were just chatting and I'm asking her, how are things in your city? What, you know, what's it like where, where, where you are? And she tells me that she had done a dance flash mob with her students in her town and her competition put her down for three minutes. And I'm like, why? You're just promoting your business. You're doing something fun for your students. Why would they put you down? Like, I don't understand. And I went home after that weekend and when I came back and I, I just could not, I absolutely could not stop thinking about it. And I did the flip out a little bit here. So what's in it for me? I'm going to tell you this story because I am hoping that from what I share with you today, you can, you can apply some of the lessons that I've learned into your own business, whether it is a social movement or not. So as I said, it just started with coffee. So I came home and I just could not stop thinking about it. And I kept thinking there has to be a way to bring competitors together. Why can't we work together? Why can't we cheer each other on? How can we do this? There has to be a way. And I kept thinking about it and I kept thinking about it and I kept thinking about it. And then I had an idea. And the idea was, why don't we unite the community, the dance community, through flash mob, because we're doing a flash mob. Let's do it so we can fundraise for charity. And then we're gonna spotlight the businesses that get involved. Everybody wins in that. So what did I do? Yeah. What is a flash mob? Flash mob is it can be done with different activities, but a flash mob is when a group of people suddenly appears, does an activity in public, and then dissolves and disappears. So it's an expected event in the middle of public. How many of you have ever seen a flash mob? Video. You've seen videos? Have you ever seen one live? Two people? Okay. So that you've seen them as dance flash mobs, you've seen them as free da dance mobs. What kind of mobs have you seen? Uh, the 2010 Olympics in New York. Oh, 2010 flash, that was a dance flash yes. mob. 
for the zombie flash mob. Zombie flash mob. An orchestra flash mob. So you see, they come in different forms. You see them all. Yeah, they know before. So wedding flash mob. So wedding flash mob. Cool. Very cool. So I wanted to unite the community, and I thought, okay, she did a flash mob, and the community put her down. Let's let's get the community involved. Let's make it part of what we all do together. Now I have to give you a little preamble because when I had the studio at the time, we had all kinds of dance dance forms, dance styles. We had ballroom, we had Latin, we had hip hop, we had ballet, we had jazz, we also had belly dance. So I thought we're going to do the belly dance because it's the one dance that most people don't see out there in the public. And if we're going to fundraise for a charity, I chose a charity that was really near and dear to my heart, and that was shelters for victims of domestic violence. And then I figured all the businesses that will be part of the flash mob, well, AKA the teachers, uh, would benefit. And the competition would benefit. So if they get involved, they get the promotion back. So they win. And anyone else who wants to sponsor also wins because we need spotlight them as well. And I think you will leave that question to Amy Beth. So, how was I going to make this happen? My only experience at this point was eight years of running a dance studio, producing dance shows inside a theater local. And I wanted to do this flash mob here in the Lower Mainland with all the competition, my own competition here in the Lower Mainland. So what I did, I called my competitors one by one. I did not send out an email and I did not blast it. I wanted to contact each one of them and I said to them, I, I'm holding a meeting and I need you to be there. It's very important to me. I did not tell them why. So I set a date, held a meeting, and everybody came, and I shared my idea with them. And I said, what do you think about us coming together? You tell your students, I tell my students, and we're going to do flash mobs. We're going to do them in different areas here in the Lower Mainland. So at the time I was in uh, Fort Coquitlam. So we'll do Fort Coquitlam, we'll do Coquitlam, we'll do Fort Moody, and then we'll do New Burnaby, and we'll do New West, where all the different teachers were located. So that their area would be spotlighted, so it would be a way to promote their business <coughs> as well. And they surprisingly said, yes, they like the idea a lot. So we were on. And that was the, bit, the first time I'd ever done anything working with my competitors, other than inviting them to dance my show sometimes. That was the only time we actually worked together in collaboration to do something. And the reason they agreed to this is because we found something in common, common ground. How you, find, you turn your competitors into your allies by finding something that we all agree on and something that makes it worth it to them as well. Because you can believe in a cause and you can believe in the same cause, but is it worth it to them to work with you? So finding that one way to work together so that it would benefit everybody at the same level made the difference and made them say yes. And also building the trust. And I believe that the fact that I build the trust in them saying yes is because I connected one-on-one -on -one with them instead of sending a mass email and say, hey, I'm having a meeting, come over, and then nobody responds. Okay? So just making that one-on-one -on -one connection and then physically meet together in one spot and then have that conversation versus trying to do a dialogue over the phone and like communicate that way. So that's what I believe made the difference in turning the competitors into allies in this process. So, and so it began. So how we were gonna do this, I'll tell you in a minute. So, so this is what happened. They told the students and word started spreading. People posting it on Facebook, they were, they were shedding online, and before I knew it, people, this was supposed to be a one time event, like I said, in the lower mainland. Before I knew it, before we even started, 
this is what people are saying. I can't wait to do this next year because we're building the, the excitement was building. I had this conversation in November 2010 with my competitors. The event was taking place in May. Before May happened, this is what was happening. I can't wait. Everybody was excited about doing this big flash mob. And what happened was exactly that. The unexpected happened. I had registrations opened. If you can sign up, it's a lower mainland. More than 500 people signed up, and 375 of those registrations came in in the last six hours before deadline. I was not set up for that. I was not expecting that response. And people were absolutely excited. I close it. It was literally, I had finished teaching the class. It was 10 p.m. I go to the front desk, I'm looking at the computer, and I open my emails. We were getting the registration. Um, payments through PayPal. So when you get a payment through PayPal, what happens? You get an email, right? You get an email. And I'm looking at the emails and it, it, it was going like this, ding, ding, ding. And I'm like, oh my goodness, like, what am I gonna do? I have to process these. And the thing is, this had gone outside of the lower mainland. So now there were other locations that were saying, we wanna do this in our town as well. Can we do it as well? I'm like, sure. Registration's coming to me though. So I'm processing, I'm supposed to process all this. And you have to keep in mind, I have a deadline. And I'll explain to you in a minute what this line, the deadline is about. The deadline was March 31st for the registrations, even though the event is in May. You'll understand in a minute why, why this big gap. Okay. But I was not set up because of it. Like I said, this was, was a one-time event. We're talking back. 2010, I, don't, I think Eventbrite was fairly new. I had never heard of it. That's not how I sold tickets. So I was not set up for anything. We ended up with 35 locations signed up. Most of them in the US, all the way down to Florida. We even had a location in Vietnam. <laughs> Unexpected. So totally opposite of my first business where I opened the doors and nobody was there and here this is a one-time event and it's just like this is going insane and I'm like I'm excited because like, wow this this is great but on the organizing on the logistical side a little nightmare so 35 locations so these were my tasks <laughs> well there were a lot of tasks but these, these were the top three I had to process the registrations I had to get the numbers, I have to get the names of all each location and then I had to send those to a team leader because each city that signed up basically had to have a team leader to be responsible to group the people, get permits to where they were going to dance because by the way, if you ever plan a flash mob, you don't just show up. You don't just show up and dance because you could be arrested <laughs> or dance or freeze or whatever it is you would do. You need permits. You have to make sure that wherever you do it, you have that covered so people <laughs> didn't get kicked out. So I had to let each location, 35 locations, well, not quite 35 because we have a little mainland, but about 30 locations had to know who was signed up under their team. And now I had to pull every PayPal registration and copy the information and create separate documents for each team leader and let them know who, who, who to contact, who the names were and their emails. So a bit, of, a bit of work that I was not prepared for when I was already working extra hours in my own full-time business. Then I had to place a screen printing order for, can I, can I, uh, so what I promised the registrants were three things. So part of the registration, because it was a registration fee, they would get a t-shirt that would be our uniform. So people would know who we were because of course, I'm all about branding. <laughs> so everyone would get a t-shirt. They would get a hip scarf since we were doing belly dance. Oops. A hip scarf, just make it a little different than your regular dance flash mods and a water bottle. Simple, right? But I had to get all 
screen printed, not the scarves, but I had to get the shirts screen printed. So now I have to make all my totals, get all my totals of how many smalls, mediums, large, extra large, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you see it? Oh, there you go. <laughs> I had to get the screen print. Uh, the, we had to get all of those numbers calculated for the screen printer. And we had to count all of those twelve cities. And we had to mail these. I promised them individual homes. So we're talking 500 packages versus 35. So 10 to 10 liters we were sending them to individual homes because that's what I originally promised. So I had to stay with that. Shipping day adventures. Because they had asked for the deadline, and that's why that gap, March 31st, I gave myself time to figure out the code registration by March 31st. I'll give it to the screen printer, get the shirts printed, we'll be ready in time for our May event, which was right at the beginning of May. But now they've wanted these extensions. I missed the deadline. I want to join in too. So I extended it by a week. By the time I got the shirts and I got the scarves and I got the bottles, it was the event was on a Sunday that first year. It was a Saturday, one week before. That was the last day I could ship. That's when I got the shirts on Friday. Wow. So, <laughs> so like, okay, I have Saturday. I can ship these. To the U.S. Remember that most of them are in the U.S. So what I'll do is to make it faster, I'll bring the shirts with me. I'll go across the border and ship them from there. I mean, they'll be faster than shipping them from here. So no problem. I can do this. I can totally do this. So put the shirts in a box. I thought I'll just pack them there too. They didn't have time to. I had just gotten them on Friday. Figured I will. I will pack them on the Saturday at the post office. And of course, come to the border. Why are you coming across the border? They ask you the questions. And I'm telling them, oh, I'm mailing these shirts. I have no idea what I'm talking about. I've never done this before. Completely ignorant, right? So they sent me in a special lane where all the trucks go with their merchandise. And I have to go into this office. Can you go into the office? Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay. So I go in there and there are a few border officers and they're doing their own thing. And I'm like, what am I supposed to do here? And nobody's helping me. And I'm like, excuse me. And they're not giving me the time of day. And I'm like, uh, what's the time? Like, today's my last day. I need to get these shirts out, right? So eventually I get some attention. They get me to fill out some forms. They're really, really, really a lot of time in there, but I could not afford. Managed to go through the custom. And now I had to find packaging. I thought, no problem, go to Staples. Those staples, they did not have over 300 packaging for my threesome here to fit all of that. And I was going from every possible store you could think of, Walmart, any any store, and I could not find what I needed. Eventually found this tiny little shop in Ferndale. So if you guys know where it is, just cross the border. Uh, little like gift shop, and they had these. Um, they look like large envelopes, but they're made out of plastic. So it's a plastic envelope. And when you put these in, they look like a big bag of chips. <laughs> because unless you press it, you won't let the air out, but that's what it looked like. But they had exactly the amount I needed. So I bought them, rushed to the post office. And I don't know if, you, if you've ever been to Bellingham Post Office, that picture is the actual post office where, where I went to. Anybody ever been there? The Bellingham Post Office. You don't know what I'm talking about? That one there? Recognize it? No? Okay. So if you happen to go to Bellingham to the post office, I'll describe it to you. When you walk into the building, on the right of the front is where all the PO boxes are, where you put the rent PO boxes. On the right side is a glass door, which is the actual post office where you get where you ship your stuff. And then on the left side, you can kind of see this whole side with all those windows. That's like a big long alley of glass and a counter. Oh my, it's about 40 feet long. I don't know, I'm not good at measurements, but it's probably about 40 to 50 feet long. 
So what I did eventually, when I finally got there, I set myself up where this, this big long counter was. Start pulling out all these shirts, trying to organize them all by city first, and organizing all the, the bottles, the sizes, and all that stuff, labels, because I had all the pre-printed labels. I had done that, thankfully. I had pre pre-done those. And so I started packing them. I had a helper with me. So we start packing, right? We're not distributing anything, it's kind of out of the way. So we, we start doing all the packaging and these things start getting bigger and bigger. There's these piles of these packages that look like big bags of chips. <laughs> these big bags of chips. Don't worry, it'll turn on by itself. So I went to, at one point, it's like one o'clock. And I go across the corridor, the, uh, the, the gallery, whatever you want to call it. And I go into the post office and I had a question and I said, listen, I have a whole bunch of stuff that I need to mail. Uh, where do you want me to put them? Do I go to the back? Do I come to the front? And it's like, no, you can bring them to the front. How many pieces do you have? And I'm like, well, I have over 300. It's like, okay, well, we're, you know, you know, you have, where, where are you shipping exactly? So I showed the one package and, and the guy says, well, you have to, uh, you have to fill out these little forms. So <laughs> I'm like, for every package? And he's like, yes, you have to write the value in each package and what in them, even though they were going within the US. So I'm like, just added extra work. So I go back, I'm like, okay, we can do this. So back to the line, but I have my little, uh, what do you call it, like chain, chain line, you know, have the, your own little methods. I'm like, we're packing, we're packing, we're packing, we're packing, and we're throwing them in, in these boxes, big boxes. And then I look at my watch again, and it's now like 2.45. I go back in and I say, what time do you guys close? And he goes, three o'clock. <laughs> And we barely made it to the half of the actual delivery. And now I'm starting to panic. I'm like, okay, we have to order super fast here. So pack, 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 pack. I go back to the post office and now it's five to three. And I know there's no way we can finish this. There's just no way. And I said, can you extend your, can you stay open for me? I'm in here. And he said, oh. <laughs> we cannot, but if you're inside here, these were the doors. If you're inside here at three o'clock, when we close the door, we can't kick you out. But if you're on that side of the door, we can't let you in. No, I want you to picture this. I'm wearing high heels, skinny jeans, <laughs> very tight. And we were set up at the very end because we didn't want to disturb anything. So I am like running, calling my house. Bring that stuff over. And he's throwing them and I'm throwing them at him. And it got to the point where I'm literally right next to the glass doors of the post office. And stuff is being thrown at me and I'm throwing it into the room <laughs> so that they can't, and my one foot is by the door <laughs> so that they won't close the door on me because they told me that. <laughs> so we managed to pull everything in. We finished packaging in there. And then with my help, we started filling all this up. So we closed at three. But they didn't get home until they didn't literally leave the building the next day. <laughs> so everybody got a bit time there. <laughs> there was no way I could ship those home on Monday. They would have never gotten home on time. I had to keep my word. And I lost my shirt on this because when I quoted the shipping costs, I had no idea what shipping costs were. I quoted $3.50 per. Not realizing that it actually worked in the States in 2010 for most of the packages, but not within Canada. Within Canada, one of the one of the packages that went to, I think it was New Brunswick, back east anyway, I paid over $30 for it, regular postage, because of the sizing and the shape. Very expensive. <laughs> Very expensive. And people were saying, you can't wait till next year. And I'm like, can afford to do this next year. Not not this way. So that was my little adventure <laughs> at the post office. So it happened. Uh, at the beginning of May of 2011, we had
had our very first global worldwide launch mall with 35 cities to start with. And it was a success. And what I didn't realize was what was really bringing the people together beyond um, just the fact that we want to do dance. So why was it successful? This event provided a stage for dancers. That's what dancers want to do. They want to dance. They want to perform. They want to be seen. The, the businesses, they wanted business. They wanted visibility. But they, we also had a common cause that was much bigger than I realized. So when I picked the domestic bottom shelters as as the recipients of the fundraiser, because part of the uh, part of the packaging and part of the registration, that money goes to um, to local shelters, and I made it so that each location could choose their local shelter. And that portion, based on how many people signed up in their location, a portion of the registration would go to them, not all in one place. So it was not all about this charity or all about that. It's really about what the cause is. So it's a bigger picture, not one person, not one entity, not one organization benefiting from this. And when I say the comment was bigger than I realized, is that the problem was bigger than I realized when it comes to domestic violence, because when we look at the stats, almost 50% of the people are affected by it. And so within the dance community, a lot of people who have been through that or were dealing with that currently, who had known people who had gone through that, could identify and want to be part of it. And I don't have a picture, um, I, didn't, I didn't include that picture here, but there is this picture of one lady who till this day participates. And that first year, she took a picture of herself with a picture of her best friend who had been murdered by her husband. And that spoke louder than anything else. Spoke louder than any dancing, spoke louder than um, any promotion of any sort of business. So that's kind of what started bringing and creating more and more into this event. And also, people resonate with values. Values that, you know, of the event are community, having fun, creating awareness, integrity, and leadership that people are leading. So it all fell good. It's still good. <laughs> Any questions so far? Uh, just to prove the next point, if you would mind, can I get you guys to stand up? I want you to imagine you're waiting for the bus. And the bus is just not coming. And you've been now waiting for over two hours. You were supposed to be here two hours ago. And what happens when you wait? You just start getting tired. And you shift your weight. So I like you to kind of shift your weight so whichever leg is most comfortable. Think you're, okay, now you're just like really tired, right? And now you're getting really impatient. Can I see you be impatient? Can you show me to be impatient? Yeah? <laughs> and, now I just, and now I just look at your watch. Even if you don't have a watch, just pretend you're looking at your watch. And then you go, oh my goodness, look at the time. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have a watch? You don't look at the time? No, I don't have a watch. Pretend it. I don't have one either. Pretend. Okay. All right. And that's how you lead a movement. I got you moving. Thank you. It's going to break the ice. It's easy to get. All right. So one of the other lessons that I've learned here, other than, you know, get your, just prepare for bigger than you expect is always good. Um, but always lead with vision, but also lead with depth. What I mean by that is it's easy to lead with vision. If you have a vision, you say, I want to do this because of this. But what are the little whys? What are the little whys? Why are we doing this in this, this way? And why are we doing that that way? And that is actually what I find is the glue that keeps the people together and also makes them move fast. The little picture that makes the big picture. Why do we? Why do we wear a shirt 
with the logo? Why can't we just wear belly dance costumes and we can show our bellies? I was one of these complaints. Why do we have to wear shirts? Well, let me tell you why. Because if we're representing out there and you complain all the time that people think you're strippers when you're not, then let's show the dance for what it is and not distract the audience with your belly for one day out of the year. That's why we wear shirts. Also, we want them to know who we are. That's why we make, that's our banner. The logo is the banner. We don't need signs, we don't need posters. We are the banner. If you wear your regular costume, nobody knows they just see a costume. If you wear your regular clothes, they just see your regular clothes. And then you leave and they'll forget about you. Oh yeah, we just saw a group of people are dancing. Hmm? Know nothing about them. Actually, this reminds me that um, a few years ago, my brother lives in the US and he was telling me about some friends that were visiting him that were stuck, uh, they, they, they were spending some time in the Denver airport and they were telling him, Oh, we were at the Denver airport and we saw this group of uh, belly dancers who were flash mobbing and they, they had a shimmy mob shirt. He's like, that's my sister, my sister did that. So it was really interesting, the power of branding, and making sure that people know who you are. Okay. So that was one thing. And also when you're leaving, um, always follow up and make sure the structure and instructions are understood. Do you understand the instructions I gave you about waiting for the bus? Yeah. yeah. Anybody who can tell me? No. Okay. So be very clear as much as you can. It's always easy to, when there's a lot to, a lot of directions to give, it's easy sometimes to miss some of the information to solve some of the facts. So it's very important to follow up and say, did you understand? Run it back by me. Do you understand why we're doing it? And these are just some of the lessons, yes. I'm sure somebody that you sent one of the packages to was an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur had received it said, great idea, only I can do it better. <laughs> and so they kind of corrupt what their plan is mm -hmm. with good intentions. Yeah. They want to make it better, but they change it. Yes, it's how happened. Do you, how do you manage that? You manage it because you are you, and as much as they can try to copy you, it's a copy, and the people who followed you in the first place, if you stay strong, this actually happened. So what happened was, they, I believe it was a year or two later, I don't remember exactly when, so it was one of our own members who did that. She started her own group, but what she did is she made it a little different where she's using a different style and the way we do it is we, when, when somebody signs up, this is how it works. When somebody signs up, they, they pay the registration fee and then they know they're gonna be dancing. They know they're gonna receive the shirts. We don't send the bottles and the scarf anymore. Now it's just the shirts because we have to make it affordable. <laughs> and, um, but what they also do is they get, uh, from us, they get a video tutorial. So they create an account. So the account's on the website now. It's a whole different story. We've grown. Everything's automated. Um, so what they do is they have access to video tutorials of the dance because we dance the exact same dance with the same music every year on that same day. And the way she's done it differently is they use they choose a song, but each team can dance their own dance. And they don't wear shirts. They wear costumes. So once they're done, nobody knows who they are. They just run a group of belly dancers that is doing it and they don't do it for charity either. Um, if they did, if somebody wanted to do that, they're more than welcome to, it's a lot of work for very little money. So is it worth it to them? If they can do it better, good for them, then I have something to learn. So, yeah. So I think I probably missed the uh, part of your presentation where you were talking about uh, I was just wondering, how did you drive a lot of uh, leads to your events? Like you said, like you got sold out before even the deadline, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, what sort of strategy did you use that uh, went viral? 
the, the strategy was when I had the meeting with my competitors and I explained to them what I wanted to do and they said, yes, we'll do it. I told them to tell the students, obviously. Their students started talking about it to their friends and to their other belly dance friends and it just spread. It what just, about, right? all word around. Not one penny spent on marketing. All word around. Did you use any? Uh, you, you use social media, right? It, it was it was only Facebook. We used Facebook. only Facebook to yes. But I did not know that this was going to be that big. Yeah, yeah it was supposed to be a one-time thing. Go to mainland. So you didn't even have a Facebook fan page or anything. It was just like there was no Facebook fan page. There was nothing. Nothing. Just you post on your own personal Facebook. There was there was a Facebook group. Uh, that was for belly dancers, but there are multiple groups, so people were sharing the information. I was not telling them to, to share it, they were sharing it. I was like, uh, it would be interesting to know, like, what posts did you <laughs> What posts? Yeah, what kind of posts did you have? I did not post, I don't believe I did. Like what, how did you announce your event? I only told my competitors that we were going to do it here. Two people told two people, and so on, and so on, and so on. When you want something, let's say you, 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 you sell streetwear, yes? Yeah. All right, so you have this awesome, fantastic outfit no one's ever seen that is just like the hottest thing, must have. I know about it, I'm going to tell my friend about it. My friend loves the same idea, I'm going to tell the other friend. So it just spreads where the ones like Somebody told me it. Oh, yes. It's it's a very small community. The belly dance community is a small community, but it's spread all over the world. So we have that. Yeah. It's very connected. Yeah. Yeah. So these are some of. Does that answer your question? Yes, I would like to do something like like what you did, you know, it's not that easy. When I look back, I think part of the reason it, it spread so quickly was because it was pre-algorithms. And everybody could see everything you posted. Everything. It was not as massive social media as it is now. So that was back in 2010. So I have more lessons here that I want to share with you. Um, so these are some of the lessons. Obviously, I've learned a lot, a lot. It's been nine years. Every year has been a growing experience in many ways. You deal with all kinds of personalities. You deal with some egos. You deal with people who um, think this is their thing and you have nothing to do with it, even though you're the one who's created the whole thing. There's, you meet all kinds, and then you meet people that tell you how to run things. Some, some, of, that, some of that is valid, some of, some of it is not. And anyway, so this is the name of the actual uh, movement. It is Shimi Mob. It is now an official organization, so it is a registered company uh, based on the fact that we were doing it year after year. It, it, it became very obvious that this had to become a formal company and that I could not do it as my own personal event anymore because I was sending donations and they were coming out of my personal bank account, Francesca Amagazi, and then people were saying, the charity never got the money because they were expecting the money from Shimmy Mall, which was not a company at the time, and I just, it didn't have its own bank account. Then I get it all fixed. I'm like, okay, so now everybody gets. So I have to send all my personal information. Like, yes, yeah, here, look, the screenshot of my bank account. I just send the money. So always separate your business from your personal. Make sure you keep that separate, especially in the in the company part. All right. So this is where we're at now. Like I said, it is a belly dance community, the small community, but in the grand in the grand scheme of things, it is pretty big. What we've achieved. So we we've been holding this for nine years. We're next year will be our 10th year. We're in 49 countries, 1,250 teams. Actually, this is not even correct. We have more than that. We've surpassed the 1,300 number as of yesterday. 
And uh, right now it's up 13,550. So that's what Shimmy Malt is. Um, yes, question? Shimmy Malt is a re regular registered BC company, or is it a non it, 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 it is a registered corporation. But it's, it's registered as a regular company? It is registered as a regular company, even though between 25 and 30 percent of all the profits are donated. So I, I treat it the same as a, as a social enterprise, uh, but it is registered as an actual corporation. And I do not want to go the nonprofit route because I don't want to deal with the whole maze. Yeah, the whole, yeah. No, yes. So it is an officially uh, registered business. Do you get any flack because no. it's, a, it's a for profit business? I have never received any flack. We give the donations. We we do what we can. So yeah, no problem with that. No problem with that. All right. So it is international, celebrating a tenth tenth anniversary, and I do want to give you. I have twenty five here. That I got. I mean, what kind of lessons can I share with you? There's twenty five more <laughs> that I have. So I'm gonna run through these quickly. Even though we don't have a lot of time. But these are the things, the key, key, key points um, that I want to share with you that you know you can possibly use in your own business. I've learned that passion is primary, but excitement is essential. Okay. You've got to get your legal rights. <laughs> your legalities have to be in place and get your trademark in place as well. Because that's one thing actually that also we um, we have to face a lot of people wanting to use our logo for their own thing or the name or their own little in fact I've heard of people saying oh we we did shimmy mob and I'm like um, I don't see you guys ever registered oh well maybe we didn't do it with you like <laughs> so shimmy mob is a trademark so we've we got to fight with that as well uh, communication again that must be clear as much as possible all the time especially when you're dealing with a lot of teams and a lot of people, um, stick to your values, no matter what. I could have easily given up. I was going out of pocket. The post office <laughs> was shutting down on me. The border gave me a hard time, like you name it. I could have easily gone home. I've told this story in more detail in the past and people said I would have, I would have given up. I'm like, no, people paid for this. If they were expecting this. There's no way I was going to back out. So that's part of my integrity. I was going to make it happen when I walk, even if I had to walk and deliver each package, I would have found a way to do this. Uh, make your values known. Make sure people know what your values are. And whatever the challenge is, you can get about that. You can get above it and figure a way out. And I know you're all entrepreneurs and you already know this part, but it's good to be remembered that sometimes the things are getting tough, you just go, oh. But you're always, you're always able to be above any challenge and solve it. Um, and as you know, you have to hold the fort. You always, no matter what, have the ability to influence people. That's what I've learned with this event. Always. So even when you feel like people are not listening to you, then it's just a time to step back and understand and ask yourself, why are they not? What's not clicking? It's all me. I'm not communicating properly if I'm not getting that response. Um, creating a movement is no different than running a business. It's exactly the same. They're different in the shape of a business, but it's the same. The principles are the same. Delegation, when you go big, is very important. Um, make sure you don't abdicate. We heard that, the delegation is not abdication. You want to make sure that when you delegate, you still stay on top of things, that you don't get out of the picture. One thing that I did, um, that now looking back, I would not do it again, is when I started, when we did the first year, even the second year and then the third year, when we came back and we repeated the event, I kept saying, this is not about me. 
So I made my face invisible. My face was nowhere on the website. It was nowhere. Um, I always communicated without really having much of a presence. I gave all the presence to the team leaders. And that was actually dangerous in some areas where the team leaders started claiming the event as their event and not ours, which started creating some problems and had to do some taming the fires <laughs> and putting out fires and then deciding, okay, I can lead, still not make it about me, but I need to make sure that people know who's at the head of this and I have to make myself visible, but also stay humble enough to not say, hey, I'm the one who created all this because it's really not about me. Always bring back the focus to what it is that we're doing. Um, it is our responsible to be role models and lead by example. Um, I cannot do it alone. I could not do it alone. I could not have done it. I could not have done this alone without getting the competitors on board. I could not have done this alone going to the post office and getting all the stuff shipped. I could not have done it. It, it, was, it would be impossible. So get help. As entrepreneurs, we tend to want to do everything ourselves as much as possible, especially women. Don't know what it is with us. We, we, we feel like we can do it all. Men are, men are better at delegating. So I think it's very important to always remind ourselves to delegate, separate, and do what you're really good at. And let the things you can't do, just let other people do that for you. Um, have an advisory board. I started this only recently, all these years, and I'm getting so. I've always gotten the feedback from the participants every year, asking feedback because that's important. I want to know everything. What did you like? What didn't you like? Why? What can we do better? Always. What can we do better? But just recently, I added an advisory board, so I picked different uh, team leaders from different parts of the world, and they are my advisory board from wherever they are because. They're in the trenches, and I need to hear from the trenches, and I need to hear from leaders as well as the participants. Okay, so you want that input constantly, and also the advice and different ideas and different perspectives. Because my way is a great way, but it's not the only better way. It isn't always the better way, even if you have the better way. So it's always good to be open and try different things. And also be very wise not to just try everything and be careful how you do things. That's why an advisory board is really good. It's a great way to get some um, opinions and feedback in a group setting without feeling that you have to do anything they say if you don't agree with it. So it's just so important. Uh, patience, consistency, conflict management. And resolution skills are a must when you're dealing with a lot of people, especially when all of these people are working together. If you're working with a lot of people individually, then it's just you and that person. But when you have these groups, you have to be prepared that some drama will happen, some ego will happen, some personality differences will happen. And also, as a leader in your company, or your movement, or whatever it is you do in your business, when you define, you have to be very perceptive and open to understanding and open to putting yourself in the shoes of the other person and understand that they're all walks of life. You don't know where this person has grown up. You don't know what culture they've been around. You don't know what they've been experiencing. Why are they acting the way they're acting? So it's Something that's really taught me, like I've been dealing with thousands and thousands of people. And this comes up every year. You get, I get all kinds of personalities. And it's very easy to go and get upset over somebody's reaction. You just have to step back. Okay, let's, <laughs> let's go top to bottom. Why is this person acting? What, what, what are the reasons? And how would I feel in that position? So why is that? And how can I best handle it so that we're all happy at the end? So getting, putting yourself in the other person's shoes. 
And I'm going to skip over some of these, but you must cultivate. This is a, is a given, but you have to constantly cultivate and nurture your connections inside and outside. It's a constant. So in my case, with Shimmy Mall, it's a yearly event. So it's very easy to say, we have our event in May, we do the promo, we get the registrations, after the event, we get the videos, we get the pictures, we can rest for six months. So we start doing registrations again, and then start again. But if we do that, we lose the momentum. So I have to stay connected and nurture all the people that participate and to keep them in my group. Continue the conversations in the group, continue on the pages, send emails from I don't bombard my people with emails because the, the, they, they won't read it. The dancers, they're out of time, they're having fun. They don't want to read emails. But so the emails they get, they know that when an email comes, it's because something's coming in. So they will open it. So registrations or deadline or whatever it is, but not bombard them with too much information. And um, always stay connected, keeping that momentum, and then rebuild the excitement for the event, and then the after event. Always have that line of connection versus going up. And then it's hard to rebuild the momentum for the next one. So always stay and connect that way. And last but not least, whatever you do in your business, whether it's local or not, have fun changing the world. And that's it. So if you want to any questions? A little demonstration. A little demonstration of <laughs> <laughs> that's a different fee. Thank you.